I like to say it takes me 90 minutes to explain to someone who has GCSE physics the shape of the universe. It's based on revealing that gravity is acceleration, no more, no less. It's a simplification of existing knowledge. It's not new knowledge, although, as you will see if you attend the show, the more you know, the more it helps. I'm not a scientist discovering new truths based on new proofs. I'm a philosopher discovering new truths that have always been so. It's a process of simplification. But this is going to blow your mind, or I'm a Dutchman. You know me, I don't like to be a bore. Boa, bore. Okay. In 2018, I recorded a video about subjective dimensions and uploaded it to YouTube. It was a deliberate act of putting myself on the record whether or not I could get any further in my thinking. That video stated that the third dimension is not objective, it is subjective. I knew I was taking a risk at the time, and it turns out that is exactly half true. First though, why does it matter? It isn't just about my pride. It all goes back to way before 2018, with the first book I wrote and self-published in 2008, Common Sense, The Philosophy of Psychology. The work had led me to a 3D definition of mind, of mind space instead of mindset. From Freud onwards, we were perceiving personality as the combination of three factors. I felt I had refined id, ego and superego to intellect, emotion and conscience. Intellect because logic and facts are the basis of rationality. Conscience because that is the basis of quality of mind. Emotions because they are what gives meaning to life. But emotions are by definition subjective. The mindset principle sees people as being not understandable, not penetrable, not knowable, except with the front that they present. It's a bit like seeing people as if they were a door. And as we know, a door is two dimensional. Behind the door, there might be just me. There might be just me and my God. But what there is not is me, my God and other people. As Portishead sang, no one else can see inside your view. But what if the th external third dimension of height, say, is subjective too? Doesn't that mean you and I share an internal space exactly as we share this outside space? Doesn't that make mind space knowable and mappable? What I hoped was true and that I could show was that the third subjective dimension inside me was matched and in fact continued on to a third subjective dimension outside of me. In that case, there would be as much to say about what was inside as there was to say about what was outside, a book's worth. In 2018, I put myself on the line and I was so nearly right. Spoiler alert, it is the second dimension that is subjective, not the third. The third and all the next are 50-50. The dimensions I want to claim, like truth, goodness and spirit, are endlessly intertwined throughout the fabric of reality. So we only see glimpses of the underlying order. Heights and width are dimensions of space in particular. 
for me, intellect, conscience and emotion would be the first, third and second dimensions respectively, not the first, second and third. To put it another way, the first dimension is truth, objective truth. The second dimension is goodness itself and wholly subjective, although just as real and just as important. And then the third dimension and all beyond are an equal mix of subjective and objective. So for example, the third dimension encompasses random chance at the lowest possible level, the roll of a dice, but also fundamental deep purpose, fate, and even God. To be honest, that's what made writing the book so interesting at the time. I mean, how do you put the workings of the conscience, which are half, exactly 50-50, 50% objective and 50% subjective, how do you put that into words? How do you come up with a definition of conscience? I wasn't convinced I could do that until, of course, I got to the end of the book. Indeed, this has relevance for the start of the universe. I visualise a starting state for the universe as the set of matter at the time, maybe just a bunch of hydrogen atoms, a set acceleration that all matter had, and a random chance direction for that acceleration. So that's a set of matter a set acceleration and a random chance direction for that acceleration. Everything started with the same acceleration, but that soon changed through the chance interactions of direction. And now the accelerations are all different. But a lot of them are still there. It should better be called the long bang since it's nothing to do with size and everything to do with continuation. You might ask, where did that initial acceleration come from? Well, if you ask me, I would say that hydrogen at the time was everything that was true. The direction of acceleration was a matter of chance. And the acceleration itself? Well, whether it came from a fixed position or no fixed position, that came from the second axis. Which is why it isn't something we can do now. End of spoilers. On to you and me. What I hoped to show is that we can see inside each other's view, contrary to the singer's lyrics. In spite of calling it mind space, we cannot enter into each other's minds the way I can enter into the external space of length, width and view, breadth. But that is because I cannot enter into the subjective space of music or beauty or kindness. But I can see all of those things. I can see that they are real independent of mine or your judgment and opinion, even though each is 100% subjective. Before I take that into the world of physics and maths, how would we put this into use if it was true in terms of ourselves? I'll give three examples, driving, watching TV and my work. I work as a computer programmer. The question we're asking ourselves about these three activities is what is the mix of objective and subjective? Is it primarily objective and secondarily subjective or the other way around or 50-50? How does that work? And the way to think about that is Am I primarily direct, is my attention primarily directed outwards 
or is my attention primarily directed inwards? So it's not specifically to do with whether it's good or whether it's true. Uh, that's the that's an example of the intertwining I was talking about. But this is a good practical example, I think, to show um, what what the advantages are of this understanding. So. So, driving. We've all done driving, we've all gotten used to doing driving, and we've probably all had the experience where we drive to somewhere we've driven to a lot of times before, we're very familiar with the route, we're very familiar with the experience, and to some extent we can do it automatically. So it's quite relaxing, our mind can wander quite safely, we can listen to the radio, we can, we can uh, amuse ourselves. Primarily, objective or subject, subjective, well primarily objective and only secondarily subjective because although your attention isn't, isn't, is only needed in uh, stressful situations, um, 100% attention is only needed in times of drama, nevertheless there has to be more attention on the road than there is um, uh, to, to, to internal thoughts. Watching TV On the face of it, one might think, well, you know, I've got to be thinking about what I want to enjoy it. I've got to be paying attention. I'm taking a lot of information in about what the person looks like, what they're saying, what the context is. It might seem like your attention is outward. However, if you go into a room where the TV is on, and you need to not watch it, that's rather a different kettle of fish. If you're on a web page and a video comes up in the corner, it's very difficult not to have your attention grabbed by that moving image, even when there's no sound on. So I think that on reflection, it's very apparent that watching TV is primarily not an objective action. However engaged we are. That leaves us with computer programming, which I've, which I've classed as heavy work. <clears throat> it might not seem like it, but uh, Computer programmers do get well paid, and one of the reasons is that not everybody can do it. So I want to tell you what it's like to actually do it. And what I have observed that I really need to be able to do when I'm at work is I really need to be able to hold the objective I'm trying to reach primarily as the primary thing in my attention. So uh, although I'm looking at the computer screen, I'm writing code, I'm testing the code, I'm working out uh, how to make it do what I think it should do under those circumstances and solving all the problems, and there are a lot that arise as I do this, none of that is actually the most important thing. The most important thing is that I hold on to where I'm going. It's so, so easy to get distracted by, well, what if I did this? Maybe then that would happen and that would be great. Or what if I did this? No, because then that would happen, that'd be a disaster. It's very, very easy to lose, lose the way and find that one has done something that is good but it isn't the thing that needed to be doing. And there is no spare time. That is the key thing about this type of work. 
time wasted is time lost and that is fatal not just to um, the work getting done but it's fatal to the opportunity to do the work and that is what you have to bear in mind you have a limited very limited opportunity to do the work before the delicate house of cards starts to fall bits starts to have bits fall off it so quite a subjective description there because there's no doubt in my mind based on my experience that primarily computer programming is a subjective activity and and it's an advantage to be able to put into words what it is I think I do when I do it well. I hope you can see why I think the book I wrote over 20 years ago, well over 20 years ago, I hope you can see why I think it's still relevant. <clears throat> I'll be honest, there are things in there that I tried to do that didn't work, but what there isn't is there isn't things in there that I think now are wrong because I've changed my mind. The fundamental understanding that I started off with is still maintained right up to today. You can download that free of charge <coughs> as a PDF from freeebooks.net or you can purchase a print copy from lulu.com. But on to physics and maths. Where in physics and maths do we see a subjective second dimension? I would say in maths, in imaginary numbers, and in physics, in energy. And the last will bring us back to the importance of mind and the continued relevance of books. So I was saying that the dimensions are intertwined and I was thinking of the last video with the examples of Moore's law and music as being a glimpse of the result of that. How that works in physics? One example that is anomalous in physics is the behaviour of light. When light passes through matter, we have long known that, for example, in water or glass, it is refracted and appears bent because it isn't taking a straight line. It's actually taking the path of shortest time, not the path of shortest distance, as it would if it was a straight line. This is akin to being able to take a sort of a shortcut. And as we know, this became the basis of the theory of relativity. And by the way, we've been able to put it to good use through super accurate clocks which are the basis of our GPS. As I understand it, we use Maxwell's equations to relate any two points by triangulation using the speed of light. It's as if we were unable to measure our position exactly in all three dimensions of space, but we can infer it using light. Now, what if I was to suggest replacing the theory of relativity with a theory of subjectivity? Instead of the difficult idea of time as a fourth dimension of space, let me hypothesize a hidden dark dimension and let's make it the second dimension of space. This is the uh, original leaflet that I did back in 20. 14 for the first talk on the shape of the universe, which gives us a bit more room. So, instead of x, y, z, and let's have one dimension and call it x 
and then a hidden dimension which I'll call Y and with only one direct <coughs> with only one external dimension there are only two directions let's call them I and O which might seem a bit random but bear with me uh, humor me at least for the next five paragraphs I talked of light as traveling from point A to point B and that is how the theory of relativity presents it but if you think of a light bulb you think of light radiating out from a center in all directions we are told that space and matter are expanding maybe it is the light that is stationary and the space that is moving now hold that thought and consider that Maxwell's equations apply to light as a special case of the general case of electromagnetism you're familiar with electricity it passes overhead in wires that are kept separate from each other and high up from us because the electricity actually wants to spread outward and leak away from the wire like the light from a light bulb whereas we want it to be conducted along the wire so we can choose where the light bulb is used the intriguing thing about that is that electricity is always accompanied by magnetism and magnetism wants to go inwards the intriguing thing about that is that electricity is always accompanied by magnetism and magnetism wants to go inwards I do think it is a little bit mind-blowing although to be honest I am happier with the way this is presented in the, in the show that I do about the shape of the universe because by this point gravity has already been presented so we've already drawn the line between energy and matter in preparation for some conjecture in fact for anyone who is wondering about how matter and gravity uh, is, is reconciled that's where the book uh, the short book the physics of gravity the shape of the cosmos and the things in it which I'm promoting and uh, explaining in the show um, the book can be downloaded for free just like the other book uh, uh, by searching on freeebooks.net search on the uh, author's name or on the title both ways will find it and a print copy of both is available from lulu.net uh, that the, the, the book is primarily about the physics of gravity it's not uh, it, it's not discussing energy at all Well, my theory of subjectivity is not going to replace Einstein anytime soon, and I'm under no illusions about that. For me, success is measured mostly in internal consistency and, if you will, elegance. If I can answer all my own questions, then the theory must hold together at a certain level of understanding. And I would not be enjoying it anywhere near as much if it did not at least to me seem elegant 
much that was in the original video is so near to the full understanding. The discussion of squaring the circle, the mention of a theory of everyone and everything, the relevance of scale, the comments about faster than light travel, and even philosophy of maths. In fact, there's only one thing I want to add to all that with imaginary numbers. So we already know that a subjective dimension is one that when we are outside of it, we always see all of it. It looks curved. When we are outside of it, it has no units. We cannot square the circle. When we are inside of it, each unit seems double the last. So is there any use we can make of such units? Well, we will see that there is using imaginary numbers. Start by thinking about a magnet again. The magnet pulls inward against the metal, but how about against another magnet? In that case, only if the poles match does it attract. Otherwise, it actively repels. In fact, if you break a magnet in half, it generates two separate magnets, which also have both poles. This sounds at first like ordinary numbers. With ordinary numbers, units can be plus or minus. Perhaps north and south poles are just the plus and minus of each other. But notice that in maths, we are clear that positive means presence and negative means absence. It is not so simple with the magnet. It is as if the plus and minus of north and south both have to be there for the magnet to work so that they are not negating each other. And when north meets north, or vice versa, far from negating, they are inverted, pushed outward instead of pulled inward. Let's look more closely at that first problem where both north and south must be present and will automatically be created when a split is made. What we are seeing there, it seems to me, is like a movable origin or zero. When you put north against north, there is no zero, it is somewhere outside. We'll keep why this repels as the second problem for now. What rings a bell with me, because I did pure maths at school, is that a movable origin sounds like what complex numbers have. Recall how the square root of minus one works in complex numbers. If the i cancels itself out, you have a real result in relation to a real reference. Otherwise, you have an imaginary result because there's no reference and it's no use. Let's take an example. So, multiplying the brackets out, we have 1 times 1, we have minus 2i, we have plus 2i, we have 4 I, 2 times 2 times i squared, which of course is minus 1, so that's minus 4. The minus 2i and the plus 2i cancel out, so you've got 1 minus 4, so the result there is minus 3. That's a real result. Taking the other example, you've got 1 plus 2i We've got 1 times 0i, which is 0, and we've got 2i times 0i, which is also 0. So we end up there with 1 plus 2i, which is an imaginary result because the i is still present. Had I done applied maths, I might have already known it, but I had to look it up. Where do complex numbers have their key application in the real world? 
lo and behold, in electromagnetism. But I think they are used because they work, just like Maxwell's equations work. There might have been an insight, but I don't think we've had much agreement before now about why. You might not be impressed by that since it might seem a little self-serving. Maybe you think we already have the answer to why complex numbers are so applicable to electromagnetism. Well, what about why north and north repel? The second problem. Do we think there is a widely accepted explanation for that? Because I would like to offer one. Remember what I said before about how a dimension that is subjective is one you are outside of and that it always looks curved. So now think about what it feels like to try and push two magnets with the same pole towards each other. What does it feel like? What it feels like to me is like trying to push two American softballs together against each other. A softball is a bit different to say a tennis or a football. It has a very thin soft outer cover around quite a light but very hard body. It's very easy to touch two softballs together just like it's very easy to feel the resistance between two magnetic poles. But if I try to de deform the surfaces even though they're soft to make a common surface the softballs very quickly resist my pushing and become harder and harder to keep together with, with, the curved surface, with the curved surface in particular. And that is the thing that is most noticeable about the magnets. However flat or square or whatever shape the magnetic poles are, the two magnets want to slide past each other or flip round 180 degrees the way the curved surface of the softball slides when I push it as soon as I try and start pushing it hard. It's because when one pole sees the same pole, it sees a dimension that looks curved, whatever the shape of the magnet. Cool. But is it right for me to say it is a single dimension? If I take two box magnets and link them south to north, then rotate them both 90 degrees, I can link south-north to north-south. I can link south-north to north-south like that. It's relatively stable. If I lay that on a flat surface, it will stay in position. But what it wants to do, of course, is that. The link is there, but it's not as strong. As a layperson, I would say that there is an overlap of the repulsion curve between the same poles with the line of attraction between opposite poles. Although a joined magnet attracts ordinary metal equally on all sides, the north-south pole is oriented along a single axis. We see an even more vivid demonstration when a magnet is broken in two. Even though the two broken edges must marry perfectly physically, and even though it is a north-south attraction, the broken edge creates a multiplicity of fronts which can never again average out to match the jagged break even though the two sides will be pulled together. All of which leads me to think that rather than north and south, we might consider renaming the two poles front and back. It would be a neat reminder that what I normally call front is only a relative, even subjective term. So we're starting to get to a theory of the 
universe as a whole. So let's look at a diagram of the three-dimensional universe. We have three axes and there are different axes to the three dimensions of space that we are familiar, so familiar with from living inside a gravity well. Well, I will say it again, this does blow my mind. But for others, it might be easier if there was some new science to come out of this to act as a proof or check. It's a lot to ask people to follow all I've said on the basis that the, word, that the words paint an attractive picture. Still, I did have to put myself on record at least once more with the somewhat half-baked thoughts because there may be an implication for the physics of gravity and the shape of the universe, so to term it. In the universe, there is no background. On a train, you can tell when it starts to accelerate which direction it is going in by looking out of the window. In the universe, you cannot do that because there is no background, no ether to compare movement to. One of the reasons why I believe that gravity is acceleration, no more, no less. I will be honest, I'm not completely sure why physicists have not reached the same conclusions as I did. I think my shape for the universe explains things just as well in 3D as it does with a non-3D topology. In the book, I use the example of skydivers to represent inward gravity contrasted to a car to represent gravity when acceleration is outwards. I think that works in all the situations that I as a layperson am aware of, but there may be something crucial I'm missing, something that a real physicist would know automatically, which I've overlooked or somehow missed. In that outside eventuality, all this might still be of some use. A dimension that has a movable origin is one in which a train that is <clears throat> a dimension that has a movable origin is one in which a train that is accelerating in one direction can flip in an instant and be travelling in the other direction. The opposite direction. I don't think there's any need for that but I'm open to hearing if anyone anywhere has a criticism or query because I'd love the chance to correct myself. Let's see what real physicists say. Now we are getting to the end of all of my investigations the other implication I want to finish on now is more philosophical. It is to do with going home, to heaven or otherwise. You see, in an infinite universe, if given faster than light travel, then we would be at risk of becoming unmoored from home. It would be so difficult if not impossible to resist the temptation to travel once started how would we ever come to rest if light and indeed electromagnetism is inherently stationary on the second dimension then perhaps we as beings beyond our own physical bodies and brains also have a default position by which we can recognize 
and thus return to home. In fact, I think I remember uh, in my earlier writing that it is males who retain their original position, whereas females have the superpower of being able to move their position on the second dimension. I've sometimes heard the religiously inclined talk of having a God-shaped gap which their soulmate can fill for them. It applies to females and males equally. But another idea that goes right back to the first essay I ever wrote about heaven, well the only essay I ever wrote about heaven, but it's still consistent with everything I think today, And that's the concept of a God-shaped destination in the universe. From my perspective, acceleration is radically polarised, being acceleration outward versus acceleration inward. But from the perspective of God, all acceleration is just acceleration towards God. But I need to draw the shape of the universe to do that, which would rather give it away. least before 2025.